Hello, my name is Natasha Sinclair and I am a teaching fellow at the Centre for Preparatory Studies in the New FIT programme. I've also been an IELTS examiner for 15 years. Today I'm going to talk to you about tips for the IELTS listening and speaking exams. Let's talk about tips for the IELTS speaking exam. The first step that you need to take when you're considering taking the IELTS exam is preparation and make sure that you know the structure of the exam. Can you answer the questions below about it? How long is the speaking exam? Well, it's approximately 11 to 14 minutes. This depends on how long you continue speaking uh, and whether you use your full minute of preparation time before part two. How many parts are there? Well, there are three parts in total. In part one, you are asked general questions about yourself, about personal topics. Uh, this is to get you feeling more comfortable before you get into the more difficult parts of the exam. Part two is what we call the long turn, and this is where you are required to speak for two minutes on a subject that is given to you. Part three is where you extend your knowledge of the subject that you were talking about in part two and you are asked more, uh, more complicated questions. What are the four criteria that you will be graded on? They are fluency, this is how well you speak, vocabulary, looking at the range of vocab that you use as well as the accuracy of your words, uh, grammar, and again, we're looking at the range of the grammar structures you use, as well as the accuracy and your pronunciation. And which of these four criteria is more important? Well, none of them. They are all given exactly equal weighting. In continuing in the first step, your preparation, you should try and build your vocabulary around commonly used IELTS topics. And there are many websites online where you can find lists of the most commonly used topics uh, in IELTS speaking. So first you look at your topics and you work on a word list for each of those topics. For, uh, for example, you think of as many words as you can that are related to that topic and you try and find a wide range of vocabulary related to that topic. Remember, we are looking at range and accuracy. And then you would think of ideas to talk about for each of those topics. If you were asked about this topic, what would you be able to talk about? So make notes. What questions could you be asked about that topic? And how would you answer those questions? This is all really good preparation to make you feel more comfortable when you walk into the exam. And the third part of preparation is practice, practice, and more practice. We see many very nervous people when they come into these speaking exams, and the more preparation a candidate does, the more confidence they will feel in the exam itself. So time yourself as you're speaking. This is particularly important for the long term where you must speak for two minutes. Um, this is part two. If you time yourself, you can understand how long two minutes actually is. It doesn't feel too long when you just think about it now, but actually when you're in exam conditions and perhaps you're not so comfortable with the topic you're talking about, two minutes can feel like a very long time. So time yourself and get used to how long two minutes really is. You can use your phone to record yourself and then you can play back uh, and listen to what you have said. And the reason for this is to check for your mistakes. So again, you have those four criteria and you can be checking for those as you listen to your recordings. So do you sound fluent? Are you using a good range of vocabulary and grammar? And how does your pronunciation sound? The second step is the exam day itself. And you should make yourself as comfortable as possible. You've already been 
preparing as much as you can, which will make you as confident as you can. But what can you do on exam day to help yourself? Well, first, most important, get a good night's sleep. And this, of course, is true for any exam. It's important to be able to walk into the exam not feeling sleepy or too nervous. And if you don't get a good night's sleep, both of those things will happen. You should also try and eat a healthy breakfast. It's not a good idea to skip breakfast because you are feeling nervous. And it's also not a good idea to have a very heavy breakfast. So something like cereal and fruit is a good idea. I always recommend bananas because they're full of potassium. You should also wear something comfortable on the exam day. This is not a job interview, so you don't have to go wearing your best clothes. Wear something that is comfortable and you will feel better in the exam itself. And you won't be judged on whatever you're wearing. And you should also get to the exam centre in plenty of time. Make sure you know where it is and how to get there and make sure you know how long it will take you to get there. It's much better to be there too early than to be there too late. And you know the feeling of when you are running late for something important, that horrible nervous feeling. And it takes a long time to calm down in that situation, which you don't have if you're running late. And of course, remember, if you are late for an IELTS exam, then you may well be disqualified for the, from that session. During the exam, here are some things that you should try and do. Be as open and friendly as you can. It's a nervous time for everybody doing the exam, but try and be open and friendly. And speak as much as you can. You can never speak too much in an IELTS exam. If the examiner actually stops you, they interrupt you, that's a good thing because it means that you have spoken enough. So. As I said, speak as much as you possibly can. Answer all questions, even the ones you think are a little bit crazy or one that you may have already answered. Examiners have to follow a script to a large extent, especially in part one. So even if you think the question is a little bit strange or you have already answered it, just try and answer it as best you can and move on to the next. If you didn't understand a question or you didn't hear it, then please do ask your examiner to repeat the question. They, depending on the part of the exam, they can't change the question or say it in a different way, but they can repeat it, which might help you. So don't feel uncomfortable if it's not a listening exam. So if you do need them to repeat the question, please do ask. You should also check your speed. When we're nervous, it's very easy to talk too quickly, and this will affect your fluency and also your pronunciation. So try to slow down and make sure that you're not racing ahead. On the other hand, of course, you shouldn't speak too slowly either, because that will make it sound very unnatural and a little bit robotic. So try and keep your speed at a, a neutral level. And if you have been listening to your previous recordings of practice, then you will understand what that should be. And you should also listen to the whole question that you are asked, not just one word of it. So questions do not always go in the direction that you will expect. So if you hear one word and you just answer from that one word, you could be answering the wrong question. So make sure you listen and process the whole question before you try and answer it more do's that you should do during the exam. In part two, it's a good idea to introduce your topic. You don't have to and you won't lose marks if you don't, but it gives you a couple of seconds just to make yourself comfortable with the topic that you're speaking about before you actually get into it in seriousness. So introduce your topic and then move on to your ideas. Part two, you really should speak for the full two minutes, if at all possible. We do say that you can speak for one to two minutes, but the examiner will do everything they can to get you to speak for the full two minutes. 
If you speak for longer than two minutes and they have to stop you, even if you're in the middle of a story, that doesn't matter. It means that you have spoken enough. Also in part two, you are given prompts. That you are given a paper with some questions on about your topic, and they are there to help you. You don't have to use them, but they will give you some good guidance on uh, what you can talk about. They're also there if you lose track of your thoughts in the middle of your long turn and you can't think of anything else to say, then have a look at those prompts and use them to guide you. In part two, if you're running out of things to say and you've still got plenty of time left, then you can lengthen your ideas by adding more detail. So for example, if you are asked about your, to describe your favorite TV program, and you have told me all that you can about that TV program, you can also go on to say, and my second favorite TV program, or, and another of my favorite TV programs is, and you can extend your speaking in that way. In part two, you are given paper and pencil to make notes, and you're given a minute in which to make those notes. Please do try and use that minute wisely and to use the paper and pencil. Um, it just, the minute gives you a time to gather your thoughts and making notes makes it easier for you to just look down and check where you're going with whatever you're saying. Again, similar to the previous part, if you lose your track of thoughts, then having some notes in front of you can guide you back. And in part three, you need to have opinions. Your opinions are um, not judged in themselves, but you are being asked to talk in a greater detail about the topic that you spoke about in part two. So you need to have opinions so that you have got something to say. If you, don't, if you are not able to extend your ideas, then the examiner will have very little to assess you on. And some don'ts. Don't ask for a different topic because the examiner is not allowed to give you it. If you don't like the topic, that is unfortunate, but you have to choose, stick with it. Don't try to memorize your answers in advance. If you do, you will sound very robotic and unnatural and the uh, examiner will notice it. And if it is suspected that this is what you are doing, it could be that you are asked to leave the exam. Try not to use Russian or Kazakh words where possible. However, if there is no suitable English translation, for example, if you're talking about um, a Kazakh food dish, uh, then you can use the, the, the Russian or Kazakh word, but you need to explain what it is that you've said. Watch out for using lots of fillers. This is the ums and ers, as that will lose you marks in fluency. And never give just yes or no or one word answers. You should always try to extend your answers as much as possible. And finally, I'd like to give you some recommended resources. You shouldn't have to pay for any IELTS materials because there is so much online, but these are my favorite websites. So the British Council and IELTS both have good websites with preparation materials and sem sample test questions. You can also go to ieltsliz.com. She has a lot of really good, useful um, materials to use and ex uh, ieltsexam.net. You can also look on YouTube. ieltsliz.com has some good YouTube links and Fast Track IELTS. Now this lady is actually a Kazakh lady living in London and she has some really good advice for IELTS. You can also, if you want to pay for uh, materials, you can, I would suggest that you use the Cambridge IELTS range. It's Cambridge that makes the exam, so their range is the best. And as you can see there, they have a few different types of books. Let's talk about listening. So the first step of any, before you take any exam, is a careful preparation. And for the IELTS listening, the first step would be to know what is the structure of the listening exam. This is important because you know what to expect when you get into the exam itself. And I have four questions. How long is the listening exam? How many parts are there? Are spelling and grammar important? And what score do I need to get band 6.5? So let's look at the answers. 
How long is the listening exam? Well, it's 40 minutes. This is 30 minutes for the audio and another 10 minutes to transfer your answers from your question paper onto the answer sheet. How many parts are there? There are four parts. The first two parts are more general English and the second two parts are more academic style. Are spelling and grammar important? Well, yes, yes they are. In the IELTS listening exam, uh, spelling and grammar mistakes mean that you lose the point. So even if you have the right word, but you have a wrong spelling, you will not get the points. So it's very important. What score do I need to get a band 6.5? Well, here is uh, the range of scores that you would get for listening. And as you can see, 6.5 is 27 to 29 out of 40. Uh, there are 40 questions in the test, four, uh, four parts and 10 questions each part. And you can see for 6.5 to 27 to 29, it is a range due to variations in the difficulty level of recording. So if the recording is easy, it might be that you would need to get higher points to get a higher band. The next step for preparation is to build up your listening skills. Uh, and first I would say, and perhaps more, most importantly, you need to practice your uh, general listening. Uh, this is to get your listening skills up to standard, um, more important perhaps than practice tests. And to practice on, with your general listening, there are some ways that we can do this. Here are a few of them. Uh, so you can listen to podcasts and podcasts are good because there are um, all types of topics so you can listen to things that you're interested in while you improve your general listening skills. TED Talks, again these are very useful especially for part four of the exam because in part four it is an academic style lecture. You can also listen to radio and TV news there are documentaries to watch, and of course there are audio books too. I would just say that if you're listening to, uh, sorry, watching TV news or documentaries, or even TED Talks, try not to use the subtitles unless you really need them at the beginning of your preparation. Also, you need to practice with lots of IELTS practice tests. This is so that you can get used to the different types of questions and what kinds of answers are expected. The IELTS exam follows a similar format each time. So if you get to know all the different types of questions, then you will not have any nasty surprises. Uh, there are lots and lots of free online resources. So there is always something, you know, lots of ways of practicing. Continuing with our preparation, you should get to know all of the question types. And there are six types of questions. Uh, and as you can see from the table here, two of those types also have subtypes. Um, we don't have time to go through all of them today, but it is important that you practice all of six types and that you have a strategy for answering each of them. Again, if you go online to the IELTS practice websites, you can see different strategies for answering each of the different types and there will also be lots of practice. And the final bit of preparation is practice, practice, practice. So you need to practice reading question instructions very carefully. Often in the listening exam, the instructions can be quite complicated. For example, it might say that the answer must have two words plus one number. And if you don't have that exact two words and one number, you will not have the correct answer. You should also practice listening to a range of accents. Uh, many of the accents in an IELTS exam are British or uh, Australian, because that's where the exams are written, are produced, but they also use accents from all over the world. So you need to get used to listening to people from all over. It's also important to practice listening to a range of voices, for example, young or old, men and women, um, because 
in some of the parts of the exam, you will hear multiple voices in one audio section. And if it is, for example, two male voices, um, it can sometimes be a little bit difficult to differentiate between the two. So practicing a list of range of accents and voices is a good idea. It's also important to practice multitasking, perhaps more in listening than any of the other parts of the exam, because you need to do reading and listening and writing all at once to be successful. Listening for synonyms and paraphrases is something else that you need to practice. Um, very often, um, nearly all of the time, the words in the questions will not be exactly the same as the words that you hear in the answers for the audio. So it's important to practice your synonyms and to understand that you are hearing a paraphrase and not the exact words from the question. Continuing with the practice theme, you should also practice completing the answer sheet. And here is an example of the answer sheet. Um, it's very important to practice using these because if you, for example, put the one answer in the wrong box, then all of the answers coming after it will also be wrong. So it's really important that you make sure you understand how to fill in this sheet. If you go to the IELTS website on uh, IELTS.org, you can download them and also for the reading exam. So during the exam, here are some things that you need to remember. The recordings are played only once. This means that if you miss something, you don't get a chance to go back, so you just need to move on. No example before part one. I've included this because up to earlier this year, there were examples before part one, but they have been taken out now, so there is no example to wait for. Remember that the questions are in order. This means that uh, the questions in order on the answer sheet is the way that the answers will come up in the audio. So you need to uh, listen carefully and it makes it a little bit easier that they all remain in order. When reading questions, it's a good idea to try and work out what kind of information, for example, names or places, or which word type the answer will be, for example, verbs and nouns. Uh, this will help you listen out for the information that you're waiting for. And you should listen only for the answers. It doesn't matter if you don't understand every word of the audio and you don't need to try and catch everything. So all you should be doing is listening out for the answers that you're waiting for. Also, Remember that the answers don't come at regular interview intervals, and this can cause panic with some candidates. Uh, they're expecting it to be regular, but it is not. Often they could be bunched together, so there may be two or three questions very close together, or there could be a long gap between one answer and the next. Don't panic if you hear a long gap and you think you've missed something. Just keep listening carefully and an answer will come along. You should remember to check the question order in any of the table or form or diagram questions carefully because they are not always in the order that you would expect left to right. So you need to check the numbers and the order in which they will come. And this is something that many candidates don't do. This is to check the top of the next page. Uh, if you don't check, it's very easy to miss the next question by the time you've turned over the page, the information has gone and you've missed it. So make sure that when you're getting towards the bottom of the page, check to see if there is another question related to the same audio at the top of the next page. And very importantly, if you miss an answer, you just must forget it and keep going. There is nothing you can do. You cannot go back. And if you worry about it, you will miss the next few answers as well. So just let it go and keep on going. Remember that to get a 6.5 or even a 7, there are opportunities to miss some of the answers and you will still be okay. If you totally lose track of 
your place in the audio, it's a good idea, a good tip to listen for the other candidates in the room turning their page. And when they turn their page, you can do the same. Uh, this is a good chance for knowing which question is coming next and hopefully you'll be able to re-find your place in the audio. Don't waste your time tidying up question paper notes. You'll generally people will write their answers first on the question paper and then transfer them onto the answer paper. We won't ever look at your question paper notes, so it doesn't matter how tidy or beautiful they are, and you don't need to waste your time fixing them up at the end. Uh, some people choose to write their answers initially in their own language. I wouldn't recommend this because it means that when you are transferring your answers over, you have to then um, try and remember exactly what the word was in English and translate it. Remember that you need to keep focused throughout. There is no time for you to lose focus or to zone out. This is a 30 minute intensive listening time. So when you are doing your preparation before the exam, it's important to practice extended periods of listening. You don't lose points for wrong answers. This is something to keep in mind when you have missed an answer, then it's always worth guessing. You won't get an extra point if it's wrong, but you also won't lose a point if it's wrong. So it's worth a try. You never know, you could be right. And use your 10 minutes of transfer time wisely. Um, you need to be very careful making sure that you're putting the right answer in the right box. And also you need to use that time to check your spelling and grammar. Now let's talk about some common traps that students fall into when they're taking the listening exam. Same and similar words used in the audio and in the question that are not actually the answer. This can catch a lot of people out. So it may be that in the question you, you can see one word and you hear it in the audio so you think it's the same, but it isn't necessarily. It could be a trap. So you need to keep listening to the whole thing and not just for that one word that's the same. Remember that they use a lot of paraphrasing and a lot of synonyms, and it's unlikely to be the exact same word. Also, you need to listen for answers that are given, but are then changed. I have an example for you here. So if my question asks for a person's surname, uh, it may be something like this. Receptionist, what is your name, sir? Guest, it's Smith, Tom Smith. Thank you, that's Tom Smith, S-M-I-T-H. No, it's S-M-Y-T-H-E. And if you put the uh, first answer, you would get it wrong. You should also listen for plurals. If the answer is students and you put student, it will be marked wrong. So you need to listen for that and other kinds of grammar mistakes. And that's the end of my presentation. So thank you for watching and good luck with your IELTS exam.